Hey, everybody, before we start, I want to thank three brand new Patreon supporters, Richard Harrington, Corey Lark, and Nancy Noons. These three folks went to mountainandprairie.com slash support and signed up to support the podcast through Patreon, which is monthly and or annual support. So if you want to learn more about that or other ways you can support the podcast, just go to mountainandprairie.com slash support and check it all out. Thank you very much. This is the Mountain and Prairie Podcast. I'm Ed Robertson. My guest today is Rebecca Claren. Rebecca is an award-winning journalist who's been writing about the American West for more than 20 years. Her most recent book is titled The Cost of Free Land, Jews, Lakota, and an American Inheritance. The book is a powerful, nuanced, and deeply personal exploration of her ancestors fleeing anti-Semitism in Russia and immigrating to the South Dakota Prairie at the turn of the 20th century. I was lucky enough to receive an advanced copy of the book, and I absolutely loved it. Rebecca seamlessly weaves together heavily researched U.S. and Native American history with a vulnerable, clear-eyed examination of her family's legacy. The result is an engaging story that not only helped me better understand the past, but provided a blueprint for how we can begin to make amends and move forward, both individually and as a nation. In The Cost of Free Land, Rebecca grapples with the complicated ripple effects of her family settling on the Great Plains. The free land that they received from the U.S. government allowed them to establish a foothold in America, and over time they found relative stability, especially when compared to their chaotic lives in Russia. But her family's stability and eventual success came at a steep cost to the Lakota people, who were the victims of stolen land, broken treaties, and the devastating loss of their culture and resources. Contrasting her family's experience with that of the Lakota makes this story all the more powerful and speaks volumes about Rebecca's skill as a writer and a journalist. Again, I love this book. Rebecca and I connected the day before the book was published, and we had a wonderful conversation. We started out by discussing why she decided to write such a deeply personal story and how that differs from most of her previous journalistic endeavors. She provides a brief overview of the Lakota people and a laundry list of the injustices that they faced during westward expansion. We talk about the complicated nature of land ownership on reservations and how those complications continue even to this day. She also explains how the U.S.'s treatment of Native Americans influenced Hitler and the Nazi Party and how she personally processes her family's role in westward expansion by working with spiritual mentors and exploring her own Jewish faith. We talked about her career as a journalist, how motherhood changed her, the challenge of writing, and she has tons of great book recommendations. A huge thanks to Rebecca for writing such an important and eye-opening book, and thank you for listening. Hope you enjoy. Rebecca, we've already been talking for quite a while before, and so I finally decided to hit the record button. But thank you so much for taking the time. We're recording this the day before... Your book is published, and I was just talking before we hit record about how much I love the book. But I wanted to start by asking, when did you decide to write this book? Because you've been writing about the West in a lot of different ways for over 20 years now. You've gotten, there's no shortage of interesting things to write about in the West. And so I'd love to hear about the process you went through of deciding, all right, I'm going to spend a few years of my life writing about this very personal part of my family's history and a very sad and tragic part of the U- United States history. And so how did this how did this idea become a book? Mm, I love that question. It was seriously an evolution and it didn't happen. It wasn't like one morning I woke up and was like, I got it. This is the book. <laughs> I I mean, in a way, I really do feel like this book is the accumulation of my whole career. Because as I write in the opening of this project, 22 years ago, I think it was, I first, it was one of my earliest reporting trips. I was a very young staffer at High Country News and I was in, I was sent out in the company car. I didn't even have a cell phone then. I had like this company burner phone (laughs) that probably didn't work much on the road. And I went to the Pine Ridge Reservation to write an article about this effort by some Lakota to grow industrial hemp for economic development. And I really had 
no real sense of my, I guess we could use the word positionality, like how my history intersected in the story. And I was sitting in a truck with this Lakota guy and I was trying to like make friends with him. And I was trying to say, oh, and I told him, you know, my family used to own land in South Dakota. We had a, we had a ranch and he was very polite, but kind of cold. And it took me so long to realize like, oh God, of course, what that would immediately mean to him is, oh, your family stole or like took land that had belonged to the Lakota. Like your family benefited from federal policies that took our land and gave it to white people. And it was only, you know, after many years of reporting in native communities and in about 2017, I think it was, I was hired by an investigative nonprofit called Investigate West to write a series of stories about Native nations and Native American citizens. Those stories ran predominantly in the nation and Indian country today. And while I was working on that series, I and I just got, to, it was so wonderful to get to do nothing but write about, sort of to finally have a, a beat that wasn't just the broad American West, but was very more specific, which was yep. what was happening in Native communities. I just could no longer bear to realize I was writing these articles as if, you know, I was this unbiased reporter with no stake in anything. And I was pointing fingers at the federal government, showing the lasting legacy of these policies of the 20th century that took so much land from Native people. And yet I just felt like, but wait, I am a part of the story. I am, I have finally found myself in this in this American collective history and starting to realize my personal history is just completely tied to this collective history because, of course, knowing that my family were homesteaders and the, that, that, for that free land that my family got, which really paved the way to my family's experience of being middle-class Americans and beyond middle-class Americans, came at great cost to their Lakota neighbors. And so it was after a long time of doing these stories, a couple of years of that, I realized, I think I want to write about my, this entanglement of my family history with this larger history. And, and it was through a lot of conversations, honestly, with indigenous elders that helped me to start to think about how I would write this book. And and also smarter friends of mine, smarter than me friends who are journalists who were sort of helped me sort of say like my friend Dave Woolman, who's an awesome writer, he said to me one day at lunch, What do you owe the Sioux? That's your book. And I thought, huh, maybe it is. And so that's what set me off on this. And and you know, I think I didn't know at the beginning if this was a good idea. I didn't know if this was a story anyone would want. And I did what I would encourage any writer out there who has an idea and doesn't know if this is worth spending years of your life on. I wrote, I applied for a grant and I got a grant from a local Portland, it's called the Regional Arts and Culture Council, and they give money to local artists and creative types. And and I used that money to do the initial research for this project, which gave me the funding to write a book proposal. And, you know, it's just helpful when I'm sitting on the edge of this book going out in the world, when I feel so nervous today, Ed, and so vulnerable to remember, I got so much help and so much encouragement along the way. I wasn't, I didn't do this in a vacuum. Along the way, there were signals from people saying, we think this has value. We want you to do this. And that first grant was the first of many of like a handful of grants that I got that, and not to mention the book deal that gave me encouragement along the way. One of the the things that I think is just so powerful about this book and it makes it, for me, it, it, it made it a lot easier, not, not easy, like it was fun or anything, but, but a lot easier to really understand a lot of the, the just the terrible things that happened to the Lakota tribe. And then also the terrible things that had happened to your family when they were in Russia and the reason that they had to leave. And, you know, all that is because you decided to inject yourself and your family's history into the middle of this 
very powerful history book. And yeah, I was, I remember at the beginning of the book, you were talking about when you would go on reporting trips, you know, when you were in the early 2000s, that one that you mentioned that you would wear kind of plain colored clothes because you wanted everything about you to present that you were unbiased and that you were a professional journalist and you were here to tell a very clear story. But then on this, I mean, you're, you're digging into your family's history and there are a few parts in the book or there's one part I'm thinking about where you had a hard time writing because you weren't sure, should I share this or not? And you were actually receiving some input from people in your family. Like, don't, no, 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 don't write that. But you decided to be as an open book um, about your whole family. And so how was that process going from, from 20 years of being, you know, following all the rules of journalism, which I don't even understand or know to really just laying it all out, not just your story, but your ancestor's story. It was so hard. It's been a real journey to figure out what what's the line about how to be as truthful as possible. And, and I, I want to be clear that for listeners that haven't read the book yet, you know, my family has been really, in general, very supportive of this project. And the the relative who didn't want me to write certain things, it had nothing to do with my family's relationship with Native Americans. It it had to do with the kind of family secrets that I don't think are so unique. Family secrets having to do with domestic violence, family secrets having to do with illegal activity. My ancestors, some of them were very involved in bootlegging in the in the 20s. And I've learned that, you know, one of the incredible things that I never knew was that part of why prohibition was passed in the first place was was like this huge effort to try and rid America of its recently arrived immigrants, many of them who were Jewish, also Irish and Italians, who came to America with experience as being saloon owners. Those were jobs that many of them had in the old country. And so they came with that expertise and they became saloon owners or working in the liquor industry in America. And so it was a very calculated strategy to say, maybe if we get rid of that industry, all those people won't have jobs and they'll go back to where they came from. And it was, that wasn't going to happen, at least not in my family. My family was like, here we are. We're not going back to that place where we were so oppressed. And so they figured out how to continue to make money in an industry they knew when especially there was still so much anti-Semitism in America that was closing a lot of other doors to them in terms of economic opportunity. But what is the word for in Yiddish is called Ashanda. And Ashanda means shame. And it was a great shame for my grandparents' generation that their parents had been involved in bootlegging and gotten caught. And so I had relatives who had really felt like they had been keeping that secret out of service to their parents for their whole lives. And here I am, this young upstart who comes along and says, no, I have to write about that because it's, it wasn't that I just was going to write about it for no reason. To me, I wrote about that piece of our history because it was part, it was connected to the anti-Semitism, the anti-Semitism in America that my family was feeling. And, Mm -hmm. and, and so that felt like a part of this American story that I was writing and the domestic violence I was writing about. Again, I wasn't just airing a dirty old secret or a Shonda for no reason. My great, great grandfather was beat on the head and really beaten within an inch of his life in a pogrom in Odessa. And really the family letters and stories about him indicate that maybe he had a traumatic brain injury from that. Like his behavior was erratic for the rest of his life. And so I think that, that the reason he beat his wife was because it's tied to that experience of being beaten in Russia. And so I wanted to show the ripples through history of these events to show that things that seem so unrelated to us, you know, you can read about 1891 pogrom in any number of histories, it turns out, but to figure out, well, no, but that actually created trauma in my family that then was passed down in strange ways 
to me, you know, comes through the line. It, it took a lot of effort. You asked like how I ended up deciding I had to write about those things. That was my reasoning, but I didn't, again, I didn't figure that out alone. After my aunt asked me not to write these secrets, I found it very hard to do any writing at all for a period of time. And I had two people who were incredibly instrumental to helping me think about how to write this book. One is an indigenous judge. Her name is Abby Abenanti. She's of the Yurok Nation. She's also a was a California State Superior Court judge for her mm-hmm. most of her career. And now she's uh Chief Justice of the Yurok Nation. And many she I mean she's won so many awards, including a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Federal Bar Association. She's a total badass and and judges all around the country are looking to her as someone who has a way of running her courtroom with an eye to how do you do justice in a cultural lens? How do you ground justice in your culture and religion? And, and she said to me early on, I had gotten to interview her for one of those articles I was writing that ran in the nation and spent a a bunch of time with her. And so early on in early our conversations, she said to me, you know, she she gave me all sorts of advice and i called her up when i was having trouble writing and she said you know if you if you don't write about your family in this context you don't only keep your family you don't get your family off the hook you let the whole system off the hook the whole system yeah. of america that was creating a place where bootlegging was your family's best option and so by not writing about it you don't you like re- alleviate everyone's responsibility for this, that this happened. And then I also judge early on, I call her judge, Judge Abby said to me, like, if you're going to do this project and you're going to grapple, you're not just going to retell this history, but you're going to grapple with what you do about it. You know, you should really study your own culture for guidance on how to respond. And so that led me to spend several years studying ancient Jewish texts with my rabbi here in Portland. His name is Benjamin Barnett. And we did this ancient process called Hevruta, which means studying in pairs. And we would read ancient Jewish texts from the Torah and the Talmud, looking at atonement and also reading more of the sermons written by contemporary rabbis who are interpreting these Torah and Talmudic passages. And in that way, you know, and and he said to me again, when I was in the sort of dark night of the soul that lasted for a few months, yeah. he said, you know, you've got it. He said what he'd been saying all along. He said, you have to tell the truth and you should be compassionate and you can be both of those things. So I tried throughout the book to be as truthful as possible, but I tried to do that with compassion as, as much as I could. I'm sure I'm, I'm sure I didn't do as good of a job as I could have, but you know, the compassion is there, I hope, in the places by creating a lot of deep context that explained, hopefully, the actions of of people in the book. Mm-hmm. Well, it's funny you say that because at the bottom of my notes here, I had three words written down that I, I thought kind of described your approach to this story. And it was compassion, curiosity, and empathy. I thought, given, you know, given all the history of why your ancestors had to leave Russia or lucky enough to get the hell out of there because it was, you know, they were experiencing, you know, a version of genocide and a version of just being, you know, people ripped from their homes. And like you said, you know, hit in the head and beat within an inch of your life and just all this crazy stuff. And they fled for, for a better life in, in America. And I think when you give this kind of rich portrait of, who these people were and their struggles, both, you know, when they initially left, but then, at, you know, over the generations, it, it's hard for somebody, I would think it'd be hard for somebody to read that and not feel some sort of empathy towards, towards these people. Because I, there's a great part in in the book where you're talking about, you know, did they, did they realize that this land that they were on was, was stolen? There was a quote on page 96 Kathy Park Hong, who was an author, said, for many immigrants, if you move here with trauma, you're going to do what it takes to get by. You cheat, you beat your wife, you gamble, you're a survivor. And like most survivors, you're a god-awful parent. And it's really hard in my mind to not feel just real compassion and empathy towards people who've been through that kind of trauma and and to not try to hold them accountable for for 
you know, standing up for other people other than their own family. Does that, does that make any sense? Yeah, a hundred percent. I think you might even be thinking of something where Judge Abby said to me at one point, like, listen, yeah, your family probably knew what was happening yes. to Indians. Like everyone knew it wasn't. And I had found Ann Tweedy, who's this really incredible legal scholar and a law professor at the University of South Dakota now, she did this great research where she found all of these newspaper clippings from around the time when my family was settling on the prairie. There were news stories where they actually had like quotes from Native people being like, we don't want white people coming onto our reservations. We don't want our reservations opened up to more settlement. So if they were reading the news, this this was not like a far stretch for them to know about. And yet Judge Abby was like being herself so compassionate said, you know, when you're fleeing for your life, when you have been so oppressed, like your family was, you're not stopping to have like a quick restorative justice conversation (laughs) along the way. Like it takes a couple generations of families to not be living with trauma for them to have the space to consider these things. And that's why it has come to you now. You are you didn't grow up in the shadow of that oppression. And so that's why it's come to you and your generation to look at this. I love that. I think it's so smart. For people who may not be familiar, can you just give a quick sketch of the Lakota tribe, the, the area that they lived in, and then the just unbelievable abuse and thievery that that took place to shave their land down to I believe it you know they they maybe they have two percent of what they what used to be theirs um if I if I remember correctly can you for people who may not know the specifics of the Lakota can you just kind of give a overview (laughs) I'm laughing because there are entire books you could sit down and read like a 12 hour it could be 12 hours and this answer but in very broad quick terms the Lakota nation in 1851 so my Lakota sources have reminded me, by the way, that they would say, we we don't own land in our culture. You can't own the land. The land is equal to us in our estimation. And, the, and so we live with the land. We live with the rivers. And so I, I try and be, I love that learning that I was given. And I try and think about that. So it's not that the Lakota necessarily would, would themselves say, we own this land, but in 1851, they signed a treaty with the United States, which reserved a huge amount of land. I think it was about 64 million acres. Okay. It's like a ton of the Dakotas and beyond. And I have a map in the front of my book that shows the diminishment of their land over time because the federal government, the United States just kept changing its mind. When the U.S. signed that treaty in 1851, early explorers had thought that the land in the Dakotas was totally not worth anything. But when the United States wanted to create a railroad that would connect California to the East Coast, they wanted to put that railroad through the Dakotas. And in the midst of where they wanted to put those tracks were the Lakota, who didn't live in one place. They traveled throughout the land following the buffalo, and they would move around based on seasons and based on hunting patterns. And so the United States, it was inconvenient to have a transient people and lots of buffalo on the plains. And so they set out to eradicate the buffalo. And they actually, it was by policy, they exterminated the buffalo down to about several hundred, you know, for millions and millions of buffalo to a few hundred left. And sorry, I'm getting away from your question, but it's all related actually. Okay. And so they, over the course, I think, you know, there was another treaty signed in 1868 that then further diminished land. In 1877, they just went ahead and stole the land. And I'm not saying that, that sounds like hyperbole to say the United States stole this land, but frankly, the U.S. Supreme Court in 1980 agreed with Lakota lawyers that, yes, the United States did steal the land, steal the Black Hills from the Lakota. And under like the legal terms that those treaties had laid out about what was required for later land takings. And, and the United States said, OK, the Supreme Court said, here's all the money we owe you. And the Lakota said, we don't want that money. We, we want the land back. And to this day, 
that money is sitting in a bank account, accumulating interest. And the Lakota, who are among the poorest people in America, of the 10 poorest counties in America in 2023, four of them are in South Dakota. And those counties all include parts of Lakota reservations. But they won't take the land because as Tim Giago, who was a editor of the Lakota Times, he died recently, unfortunately, but he wrote in an editorial not too long ago, he said, we won't take that land because we don't believe you can own own land, own your yeah. mother. So then, then there were further land takings. I mean, the way the land was taken, I am totally a policy nerd. I started my career at High Country News where the late Ed Marston, the late publisher of that publication, yep. he said, you know, High Country News is kind of like a thinly disguised policy rag. And I always think about that. And I really think starting my career there, I I have that same lens on the West. I'm always interested in how kind of complicated and somewhat boring sounding policy plays out in the lives of real people. And I really feel like these bureaucratic legal efforts to strip Native people of their land, you know, you read the language and it's pretty boring, but you see how it plays out in the lives of these Native people. And it's completely devastating because, yeah, that 98% figure, Josh Mizell, who's a geography professor at Haskell University, helped me crunch these numbers. But approximately that much land, as far as we can tell, when you look at how much land was reserved in the 1851 by the early 20th century, uh, Lakota people had, it's about 2% of what they had in 1851. And so not to jump ahead, but later in the book, you're talking about the land that the tribes currently own and they're, they're buying more land and they're trying to expand their holdings so that they get back to, you know, some, somewhere even, you know, slightly close to, to where they were. But you talk about that the land they own is owned in trust and that the federal government has uh, a say in how that land is used. And could you talk about that? Because that just really blew my mind. Yeah, it's so complicated. And for listeners who are curious, the Indian Land Tenure Foundation is this incredible nonprofit organization. They have tons of really helpful information on their website about the state of native lands today. But most reservations are a patchwork of land where I had no idea that, for example, the Cheyenne River Reservation and the Standing Rock Reservation, half of those reservations are owned by by like the descendants of homesteaders, like my families or like mostly white ranchers that actually own private property on the reservation. So there's that. Then there's this, the the tribes themselves, their land is held often, a lot of their own land, some of it they own outright, but a lot of it is held in trust by the federal government, which the interior department, which means if a native nation wants to say, develop oil and gas on their reservation or start a wind company. They have to get permission from the Department of Interior before they can go forward with those projects. So it it makes it's just one of many factors which is why it is so difficult for many native nations to have economic enterprise on uh, and or use their land also because so much of their land is is fractured and and you can they call it a patchwork is like a yeah. term that's often used you know their land is not they don't own just a huge swath of land the land has all these different you know there'll be like federal land in the midst of it or there's mostly white people that own land it makes it also very difficult for them to do a major economic development project because it's not all contiguous land it's wild uh, a few weeks back i interviewed the vice chairwoman of the southern ute tribe lorelei cloud and yeah. she was as i was preparing pre- preparing for that i was reading about the reservation and it was talking about it being checkerboard and she talked about that but i I never really understood why. I mean, I knew what it meant, but I didn't know why. And it's it's one of those things where every time I learn something new, like I learned so much from your book, and now I know how much I don't know about it. <laughs> you know, there's there's so much more to learn. And that's one of the things I love about your book and, and particularly the notes section. I think in my copy, there were 65 pages 
of endnotes. And so it really opened up this whole part of the West and the history of the West that I unfortunately didn't know anything about. And it let me know how little I know and how much more there is to learn. And so your book is the the start of a of a long journey. So again, I appreciate it. I love that. I mean, I feel the same way, to be honest. I feel like there's so much I still don't know. and it, But at least I don't think I know. <laughs> They yeah, are, you know? yeah, it's it's kind of good. It's it's humbling. I think one thing that I also found horrifying in a lot of ways in this book was how Nazi Germany modeled a lot of their genocide of Jewish people on the on what America did to Native Americans. Did you did you know about that before you started this project? Was that was that common knowledge and or was that something you learned through this process? That was one of the most I mean there were so many mind-blowing things that I learned in the course of this research for this project, but oh my god, I I write about this in the book. I was obsessed with the Holocaust when I was around mm-hmm. 10 or 11 or 12 and I just couldn't get enough books out of the library about the Holocaust. I thought that I knew so much about it, but I never knew until a Lakota elder named Doug Whitebull told me that Hitler based many, as you said, like Hitler was inspired by America to treat Jews in the way that America had treated Native people and also Black Americans. And, you know, once Doug told me that, I went and did a bunch of research. And sure enough, I mean, there's whole books. There's an incredible book by James Whitman, who's a, out of Yale, called him Hitler's American Model. And so many of his techniques for, for limiting Jewish rights as citizens and as humans, he looked to both just the putting Native people on reservations, tactics that the United States used to starve Native people, to keep them from being able to protest in the ways they might have otherwise. And then the legal framework that he used to diminish the citizenship of rights for Jews, that was taken from America. So in America, the way America had given different rights to Blacks and also Native people. It's really just when you think about the story we tell about America as being the land of the free, and then you learn that it's just breathtaking. It is breathtaking. And it's the kind of thing where I'm embarrassed that I didn't know any of that. Because when you, the way, you know, when you write it, it becomes very clear. And it's the kind of thing that it's, it's been hiding in plain sight and I've never paid attention to it or even thought to think about it. But because of your book, I do now. And it's, it's very, it's it's just really crazy. And so obviously if anybody that's got a conscience, they start feeling really bad about this. I mean, I'm from North Carolina. My family's been and my family came across from Scotland in like the late 1600s. And so you think about the American South and everything was, you know, how slavery built the American South. And then you can, you know, you just start thinking about, I just, I don't even know what to do. And, and so one of the things I loved about your book is you you talk about your process of trying to deal with this. And you mentioned it earlier, you, you worked with your, with your rabbi, but one part that I thought was really interesting was towards the end where you, you talk about this, these six laws of repentance and how that can be kind of a framework to that, that you can apply to trying to understand how do we deal with these things? We, you know, we weren't directly involved with it. It happened a while back, but we, in a way we have been, I mean, not in a way we did benefit from these, these things. And so can you talk about the, this process you went through of trying to reconcile all this in your mind? Yeah. Oh my God. I have so much. It's like, it's so exciting to talk to you. I have so many thoughts all at once. So before I get into the six steps, I want to just say a couple of things if I can. One, you know, while we, we, as I'm saying, you and I, like white people <laughs> haven't, weren't taught this, didn't ever think about the fact that of the connection between the Nazis, Nazi policy and American policy. You know, when I'm in Lakota country, it's it's not uncommon at all for people just to casually refer to our Holocaust, 
the Holocaust we've experienced here. And uh, Doug once said to me, you know, your people went through an awful, you know, he said something like, a Holocaust, it was terrible, but we've had one too, and it lasted 400 years. And And Judge always says to me, you know, we Native people, we picked the wrong superpower. We're invisible. Mm -hmm. And I do think, you know, you read my book and you said you feel bad, you feel guilty. And I've also been told so much of the time by people, by Native people, we don't want your guilt. Like guilt is not useful to us. It's what do you do about it? And I I, I don't mean to say it's a normal thing to feel guilty. But I, I I hope readers of this book can find a way to notice that they feel guilty and, and immediately also notice this isn't exactly your fault. You were not, we live in an American system that is not wanted to tell these stories. You know, mm-hmm. how many of us learned this history in school? I didn't. I went, I had excellent schooling. I really did. And no one taught me this. So that doesn't, exactly excuse me. I'm a grown up. I now have the responsibility to now that I know to go out and learn more and consider what to do. But let's not waste a lot of time feeling guilty about it. You know, I love that there's so many people who do land acknowledgments in America. But beyond that educational piece, now that you're acknowledging the land, what are you going to do about it? Could we all have little tip jars or something where every time you do a land acknowledgement, you put five bucks in a jar and you give that money to the native nation whose land you're on or a native organization that is helping native people. You know, that's action. That's doing, that's taking some responsibility and not just feeling uncomfortable about it. One of the things that the rabbi and I looked at is this 16th century philosopher and rabbi named Maimonides. And he, there's an incredible book by Donya Ruttenberg called On Repentance and Repair, where she takes Maimonides. What he did is in the 16th century, he did these six steps towards repentance. And she has a whole book, which looks at how you can take these six steps and apply them to our contemporary life today. It's a really brilliant book. And I interviewed her for the book and she helped me think about them as related to the question of that I'm grappling with here about Native American land and the benefits and the costs. And there's these six steps. And the first step is stop doing the harm. And I would argue (laughs) we haven't really stopped doing the harm in America, right? You know, and and it's really amazing in these six steps, you don't apologize until step five. There's all these different things you do. One thing is that you say publicly what you've done. You take responsibility in a public way. And so my book, I suppose, could be seen as doing that step of saying out loud the ways that I um, acknowledging the benefits my family received at great cost to the Lakota. And, you know, there's a number of other steps. It's really interesting. I, I hope people can take something from that. And, and I think hopefully, especially Jewish people can take something from that. I, I think every tradition, what judge would say is, listen, if you go back to the roots of your culture, every culture has a way for helping people work through mistakes because we're human. It's human Mm -hmm. to make mistakes. And so cultures were created around that idea. How do you move forward after you've made a mistake? That's, that's the real question. Yeah. There was a part in there that I underlined where I believe you were talking to your rabbi and he, he brought up the term, I think it was Chet, uh, which is an archery term about miss and it's just miss you miss the mark and all humans do that and so right. but it's not it's not that you missed it's what are you gonna do now yes I love that it's it's hate is actually the way you pronounce it and it's right it's like this it gets translated as sin but that uh-huh. sin isn't really the word it's just this like I missed the mark I tried and I I didn't quite I didn't quite make it and it's just such a more compassionate and less loaded term than sin, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, and that's why one thing I want to make clear in in the way that I read this book, you know, I I did have this gut reaction to feel bad and and not know what to do. But what I loved about your book that I think is missing in a lot of things that I read these days is it, you know, none of it is accusatory and none of it is like, 
you know, self-flagellation. I, I feel like what I loved about it is your focus on action. Like, all right, yes, this is bad. But, you know, a lot of the book is you taking action, trying to figure out the best way to deal with this. And I think, again, going back to including your personal story in this, that's what I think that's why it's so powerful, because I think it's real easy to write long list of everything that everybody has done bad and how awful it is. And a lot, you know, if you think about it, human beings can be just a, a rotten, a rotten animal that does rotten things. But what I loved about this is you're focused on, all right, this is what happened. Let's be very clear about it, but let's also be compassionate and then let's be, take action and, 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 and do the best we can to, to make things right. I just, I, I really, really, really loved it. And I, I just, I can't imagine the process of writing this, this thing. I mean, what was the biggest surprise about your family that you learned? Because you, you every family has their legends and I think your family is very proud of their grit and their tenacity and, and everything. You talk about the, the part about your ancestor living in a, basically a mud cave. I mean, that's <laughs> hardcore stuff. Oh um, my God. They were so What tough. was a surprise? And what was a big surprise for you? I love this question. I, I think what was so heartening was, so first of all, my family doesn't throw anything away. <laughs> I, I yeah, have a line good. in the book. That's good when you're a journalist. <laughs> yeah, it's good when you're a journalist or like a lay historian. And so I I was so lucky to have 30 day diaries that my great grandmother had written that my her daughter had kept and she let me look at so many letters, so many receipts and tax returns. And oh my God, this preponderance of information. And on the one hand, what is sort of so hard and sad is is that I feel still it's not like I can know those people and I wish yeah. I could, but what I, I feel just this sense of relief to know that they weren't so perfect as the stories always have said, it's very humanizing to realize, oh, they had what the word is Mishigas is like the Yiddish word. Like there was totally craziness in, you know, in their relationships with each other. They fought, they were unkind to one another, they worked it out. And it helps me have a little bit of perspective on my own relationships that I have today that are maybe less perfect than I wish they were to not feel like, oh, how are, how have we fallen so far from our ancestors who came here and were, you know, if, if the stories that I always told were the only thing I knew that they, they just were always like posing for photographs and these flattering clothing and they just worked so hard and they got ahead. And, you know, there's just so much white space in the edges of that telling that doesn't leave a lot of space for like, they also made mistakes and they weren't yeah. perfect either. And so you know, once I say it, well, that's not so surprising once you say it out loud, but it felt surprising. It felt good to also know that. Were there any big surprises that you took from learning more about the Lakota? There was, there was one part in there where it almost made me like tear up where, cause we've got kids that are about the same age and this is, you know, this is not a, a big surprise to people that study history, but you're talking about how the kids got sent off to these awful boarding schools at age five. And then at that point you had a, your kid was six year one of your children was six years old and just this feeling of imagining that happening to your own kid. That was so powerful to me. And I, I mean, in a, in an awful way, but were there any either good or bad surprises that came from your deep study of the Lakota? I would say that, the thing that felt really powerful is that, yeah, I had written about boarding, federal boarding schools in the past, and I knew that going into this, that so much land had been taken, that there had been these efforts to eradicate Native culture and religion. But when I was honored to have the chance to speak with Lakota elders, you you realize that history is not far away. It's not in a box. It's not this mm -hmm. thing that happened so long ago, because suddenly I'm talking to Doug Whitebull and wounded knee. His grandfather was a child who survived the massacre at wounded knee. Wow. And so suddenly time has collapsed. Suddenly he's telling me a story. His grandfather tells him of 
living of like running for his life from the United States Army who has opened fire on unarmed Lakota. And he and his mother survive by hiding in the, the like the brushes along the river and hearing the soldiers shooting at people, like walking around trying to find bodies and making sure they were really dead. And they survive. And that history then, it's in the room. It's right here. That's not something that happened a long time ago and doesn't matter anymore. You know what I mean? Like that happened over and over again. And to realize that like the United States didn't stop the process of, I mean, there are still to this day a handful of of Indian boarding schools, but it wasn't required in the same way that people go to native boarding schools or that native people, native nations themselves weren't allowed to educate their own children however they saw fit until the 70s. Like this is so contemporary. And I think over and over again, that continued to surprise me. It continued to just shock me to understand, you know, we were talking earlier about sort of the legacy of how of the checkerboards of reservations. And when you see, well, this was by design. It didn't yeah. happen by accident. The United States wanted the goal of policy, not that long ago policy, was that Native nations would no longer have Native land. And mm-hmm. so all of these policies were aimed towards that goal. And so now that's no longer the stated goal of Native policy, thank God. But, you know, it's there as this incredible guy from Cheyenne River, Remy Baldy, once said, you know, the policy, it, you can see the harm on a map. It's right yeah. there. Well, and then you you know you're talking about policy and how high country news focuses so much on policy, and then you, you talk about all this history. And I think what what you've done, I mean, you had the honor of getting to speak directly with these people, but then through your storytelling, you tell their specific stories to us, and you tell the stories of your family to us, and all of a sudden it, it humanizes. You know, it's not like. I knew your great grandfather, but at, but in a way I do, thanks to your writing. And it makes it a lot more personal and a lot more powerful than if I'm just reading some textbook where they say, and then Custer walked over here and then he did this and then he got wiped out. And, the, you know, this just kind of boring. I'm always I'm always amazed at how bored I was at history with history in high school and college because now I'm obsessed with it. And it's because of people like you who humanize it and make it fun to read. I would still be super bored if I had to read one of those textbooks. I mean, it's, it's, it really is just a, a service to everybody that, that you are, you know, you put this out in the world. Cause like I keep saying, I learned so much. Um, oh, thanks, Ed. one question for you, you know, kind of zooming out a bit about just journalism right now. I mean, we could talk about the West or we could just talk about journalism, you know, journalism in general, but how do you see, where do you see journalism going now? Because from my perspective, it seems like things are getting more and more fragmented and that they're turning into more of these kind of echo chambers. And so like if I'm reading about, a, you know, on a news site that I like, like about the West, generally I'm probably going to already agree with what they're saying. And whereas I feel like with this book you've written, I feel like it's the kind of thing that could change people's mind. And it could reach a broader audience and and maybe somebody who didn't fully understand or didn't appreciate it could learn from it. So, I mean, in your in your experience being in the in the trenches of journalism, just overall, where do you how do you feel about it? How do you feel like things are going? <laughs> you could write a whole nother book. Oh, about that. my God. That's your well, next book. Just- yeah, the next book. I don't think I am the right person to ask because I don't think I'm sitting. I've been so deep, neck deep, honestly, mm-hmm. in this project. I'm not sitting at 30,000 feet looking out at the journalism landscape. But yeah. I feel inspired that investigative reporting, even though there is less funding out there, their newspapers are struggling. That's all true. Everything you're saying is true. But there are so many amazing journalists still working so hard. There are yeah. so many of these investigative nonprofit shops that it's a new model of how to do investigative reporting. But I think it's a good model where, you know, you have these nonprofits that 
hire reporters to go out and do really important work and have the money to do it. And then they partner with newspapers. So I see a lot of reason to be hopeful, despite I what I agree, especially as like a consumer of news, it is it can be very overwhelming and we can be quite siloed in our choices. And I, I do say, I do feel like that is to me somewhat of a problem is that, uh, you know, you can just care about the arts and so just read about the arts or just read about sports or just read about history. And yet to me, what when I wrote this book, I felt like what I was trying to do was to say, so often we write about Native American history in a silo and we write about mm-hmm. immigrant history in a silo. But if you read those things in silos, you miss the depth of the injustice. Only by putting those histories next to each other and layered on top of each other, do you see the way that the United States actually picked and chose most of the time, immigrants, particularly white immigrants or white enough immigrants like my family over Native people. And you can see the relationship. You see where those histories literally push and pull on each other. But this book is not a complete history of the Lakota or of Jewish immigrants or Jewish farmers even. There are great books out there that tell those histories. But mine is like, what is the connective tissue between those histories? And I, I think that's important. I think that's probably happening more and more with mm-hmm. in, increasingly in the way we understand a more full and nuanced picture of America, I hope. Question about your trajectory and your career trajectory. How did you end up do, focusing on the West? Because, I, I mean, what was your, what was your, like, your education? Did you go to journalism school and all that kind of stuff? Oh, my God. Big secret. Never went to journalism school. That's probably I... why you're so good at it. <laughs> I don't know. I, so I went to, I grew up in Seattle. I went to college on the East coast. I went to Smith college and I, I loved going to school on the East, but I was really, I did feel like a fish out of water. I felt out of place and I am glad I had those years out there because I didn't feel that curious to spend more time on the East coast where maybe if I'd gone to school in the West, I would have always felt like, Oh, I want to go live out there. And I, I kind of quickly, I went and worked in Alaska. I was a maid in Denali national park this summer after I graduated. And I, I really didn't want to be a maid for too much longer. And I had this moment of like, while I was making beds and uh, cleaning really gross stuff up, I was like, what am I going to do? I love traveling. I love meeting new people. I love writing. And it was kind of this aha moment of maybe I should try being a journalist. And I I thought I would have to go to journalism school, but I got some really important advice from a distant relative who worked at the New York Times. And he said, he told me, he said, don't go to journalism school. It just gives you context. If you can make it on your own, try. And he said, you should feel empowered to walk into any newsroom in the country and ask for a chance. I mean, this was 1997 and maybe things have changed, but I basically did that. I was, I wanted to be in the West and I, I wanted to live in Colorado and I walked into the Durango Herald and I, I asked for a chance and the the editor was so nice. I mean, he was like, he goes, you didn't even work for your college paper. (laughs) I can't possibly (laughs) give you a job here, but he let me start stringing like freelancing for the weekly. And I did that. And I did a bunch of other jobs. I worked in a, oh man, I was a landscaper and I worked in a snowboarding shop and I, I like worked in the hair, a hair salon. And then I got, I got a high country news internship. And after doing it for, you know, four months, however long that internship lasted, I just was hooked. I loved being a reporter so much. And I, I really, I love the West. I, I love how fascinating it is. And I love how overlooked, I mean, as a journalist, I don't love that it's overlooked so often by most of the major media companies that are based on the East Coast, but it has helped my career because I do feel like there are less people out here interested mm-hmm. in writing about the American West. And so because I'm here and because it's the kinds of stories I'm interested in, it's allowed me to have success as a, as a freelance journalist for magazines because there were less people pitching those stories maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's, that's probably more than you were asking for, but that's kind of how I got into it and, and why I'm here. I just, 
I think this place is amazing and it's fascinating. And when I go back to what I said earlier about like, how do you show policy playing out in the lives of real people? The American West is so impacted by federal policy. We have so much public land here and that really shapes many places in rural America, in, in the rural West so much as, as your listeners, of course, already know. Well, and then on top of everything else, you're a novelist as well. Am I though? I mean, I wrote one novel. Do I get that's, to say I'm a novelist? That's uh, infinitely more than I've written. I mean, that's, <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, that's pretty amazing that you're and you're a mother of two. Is that right? Yes, two kids. And so, I mean, you got a lot. You got got a lot going on. How did having kids change your approach to work? Because it changed mine drastically. Oh man! So I think before I had kids, I know before I had kids, I I had success as a journalist. I think in part because. I, you know, editors would say jump and I would say how high and I would be gone to the Mariana Islands at a moment's notice and I would be on deadline and I would really set my whole life aside to meet deadline. And when I had kids, I thought, I don't know how I'm going to live like that. I don't know how Mm -hmm. I'm going to do journalism like that. And that's actually when I decided I would try writing a novel. I had gotten a big fellowship to write for a year about oil and gas development in America. And I felt like I knew a lot about that. And I didn't want to write a book that I wouldn't want to read. And I love reading novels. And I thought, well, and I got some encouragement from an editor at Simon & Schuster who said, yeah, you you know, that's a good idea. You should try that. And so I tried it. <laughs> I wrote a novel that, you know, is really a deeply reported novel. It stems from years of reporting I did. The, the novel is set in Colorado and it's the story of two sisters trying to hold on to their family's ranch in the mm-hmm. midst of a oil and gas boom in their town. And And yet I hate preachy books. So I tried to like deeply, deeply bury that research. That book had no end notes. There was like, I I hope there was no trace of end notes in that book. But people for years, I'd go to dinner parties. and It was kind of embarrassing. I felt embarrassed. Like people be like, what are you doing these days? And I'd be like, I'm writing a novel. And they'd say, well, what's it about? And I just want to be like, well, it's about feelings. Like what's what are novels ever about? (laughs) You know, but but yeah, I I wrote that novel. And then I had to rewrite it like four or five times because I did didn't know what I was doing. I guess I thought, well, I never went to journalism school, so I don't need to get an MFA because I'll just teach myself <laughs> yeah. and like that hubris. Oh God. So I, it, there was a part of me that for a long time felt like one part of me was like, had the other part of me by like a chain around the neck and just kind of mm-hmm. kept dragging myself to write another draft because I wasn't good enough still. I guess people could argue it's still not good enough. But yeah, I mean, I feel proud of that book. It was a, it was, it was really, really hard to write. But I feel like actually a lot of the lessons of how do you make a narrative that is propulsive, I really tried to apply to this book. And, and I think, I think I can only imagine writing a novel with plot and arc helped write a nonfiction book, you know, that, that I, cause oh. I wanted it to feel interesting, you know, in that same oh, way. Yeah. Well, and I could tell, you know, I was thinking about that as, as I was reading it because I've, I'm trying to do, I've got my own little writing project. And the only problem with talking to people like you and reading your work is that when I read, I'm like, there's no way I could ever do this. Like, like the, <laughs> she's such a good writer. I don't know how, I mean, it's the, the way some of the scenes you set of the prairie in South Dakota and, it's just, it, it flows right along and it's very, very, very fun to read. And again, like from a guy who used to just be bored to tears by, by history, a book like this is, it's just awesome to read. Oh, so. Ed, I'll send you my first draft and you'll feel better. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. My old boss at High Country News, Betsy Marson, she used to say, rewriting is writing. And I, I do think, you know, there were chapters of this book. Oh God, there were some chapters that were so hard and I rewrote them so many times. And it was so complicated. You know, a lot of this stuff, so first complicated. family, family history, which is hard, but then getting into the details of some of these, you know, the, the treaties or 
things about land deeds. I mean, it's super, super complicated and has the potential to be extremely boring if not done right. So oh, I, I, oh mean, my God. I, I can only yeah. imagine what, what you did because the, the end result is the exact opposite of that. It's awesome. Oh man. Well, thank you. I mean, Okay, you sent me one question in advance, which was, what are the books that you read? Yes. And I loved that question so much, but I immediately had 11. Tell me the question exactly how you phrased it again. Well, it's pretty much just whatever books are important to you. Sometimes yeah, I ask, like, are they books you. about the are they books about the American West that you like? Some of them are like, did you know? It could be a book you read when you were in high school, or college that kind of changed the trajectory of things. Just any any books that. It's a very selfish question. I want book recommendations for you. What oh my god! <laughs> well, I guess this is a long way of answering the original question you had, but like, I love that question so much because I'm a very bossy reader. Like, I love to tell people <laughs> what to read, and I am that person at the library. I go to the library every week with my kids, and I'm literally that person who like stands next to a stranger who's looking at the shelf, and I'm like, "You should read that book. That one's really." I knew good. I liked you. That's the kind <laughs> of person you're. <laughs> And I, I made this list and I was like, oh my God, I had 11 books to tell you about in like two minutes. And, and I really think part of the way I wanted to write this book, it's a braided narrative. Like I had this weird, <laughs> sort of embarrassing to admit, but I got this, like when I really was feeling myself in the writing, I was like, felt like I was double dutching, you know, if you can remember yeah, double yeah, dutch, yeah, like yeah. sort of like here I'm braiding this piece and then I'm braiding this piece. And then I... When I looked at the book list that I made for you, I was like, oh, right. Like all my favorite novels are braided narratives, all of them. And I think that comes from my journalism career of being a little distrustful of a story that's written from one perspective. And sure, of course, sure. smart people could argue, well, you wrote this whole book. It's all written from your perspective. And that's 100 percent true. But at the same time, there's a lot of voices in this book that aren't mine. And I love novels that are, that triangulate or more where there's so many different stories, you know, the story is woven from the different stories that are told. And you start to understand the characters, not just from the way they see the world, but the way other people see them. What are a few of those novels? Okay. A couple of those novels that I love. Plague of Doves, by Louise Erdrich. I mean, she's kind of a master at the braided narrative, but that one in particular is amazing. There's this novel called Late Nights on Air by Elizabeth Hay. She's a Canadian writer. My parents lived in Canada for a few years and they she's so famous in Canada. And of course, we in America don't know her as well. But Late Nights on Air is this incredible novel about in the 70s, this little radio station in the Canadian North and I loved it so much. There's an adventure story that happens in it. It's a small town story. It's a reporting story. It's so good. And I love Cloud Atlas by David Mitchell. Oh, yeah. uh -huh. oh man, that book is so brilliant. And the structure is so incredible. I also love books that like, like in that book, you have to be deep in that book before you realize, oh my God, he structured this whole novel based on like, a symphony piece of mm -hmm. music. And I loved that. Those like the, when you as a reader are interacting with the page in an exciting way like that, I love that. God. Oh, and Let the Great World Spin by Colin McCann. That's another braid of narrative that I just loved a lot. So those are novels I love. I read a lot of Joan Didion. And so I feel like whenever I'm stuck uh, before sitting down to write, I'll just pick up a Joan Didion book and try and get her voice. I mean, I'm basically always trying and always failing to make sentences like Joan Didion writes sentences. Yeah. <laughs> but I feel like at least if I'm like in the general cul-de-sac of a Joan Didion sentence, I'm I'm okay. <laughs> so I don't know. And I really love this book. There's a Dakota writer named Vine Deloria Jr. And he wrote a book called, an essay, a book of essays called Custer Died for Our Sins, which I just adored that 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 book of essays. It's so good, and I really I've seen it's old, that, but I've not read it. Yeah, yeah it's I, very old at this point, but I think it. I do think it holds up. It's so great. I need to read more novels. I, I just I don't know what my problem is, but I'm always reading nonfiction, and it's so hard for me to read novels. But I know I need to for a lot of reasons. But most selfishly, I think it makes may, would make me a better writer. I think. I, I mean, I think it's definitely made me a better writer for sure. 
And, but I know, I know that like in my family, my husband and I have this very sort of strict line down the middle. He doesn't really ever read novels. Very rarely. He loves nonfiction. And, and it's funny. I read so much nonfiction for work and I love reading nonfiction. I mean, Killers of the Flower Moon, that Mm -hmm, book really is an, an amazing book. And I can't wait to see the movie. And that book helped and it inspired me for this book for sure. Um, I was so thinking about that said. as I was as I was reading yours. That that I, that came to mind a few times. So, oh, cool! Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's the master. He's so good, and I feel like there's so much truth that is told in novels. Deep truth. Oh yeah, definitely. It's and it's truths that I mean. I think you can get the point across almost better in a novel with, with certain truths. Every time I read a good one, I'm always like, man, I should be doing this. At least half my book should be novels. And, but I always fall back into my routine and I'm this podcast. I've been saying for like eight years now that I need to read more novels. And I still hadn't. So maybe I'll, maybe this will push me over the edge. <laughs> All right. Um, so last question for you. Thank you mm. for being so generous with your time. I can only imagine what you have coming up this week, but Thinking of ways to wrap this up, you've just done so much in the West. You've done so much about telling these important stories that, you know, stuff that people just don't even know is happening or didn't know happened. And I think this book is a perfect example of that. And so any kind of parting words for the Mountain and Prairie listeners, and it's it's people that love the West one way or another. It could be through conservation. It could be through athletics, could be through history but they're thoughtful, smart people who want to learn and are empathetic and compassionate, at least all the ones I've met. So any, any words of wisdom or parting words? Yeah. I mean, I'm laughing because I feel like I've spent so much time in this project listening and speaking with older people who tell really long stories. And I'm noticing I tell now really long answers to your very simple Good. questions. That's the so point I of a podcast. <laughs> Longer the better. But, okay. <laughs> I, I think, you know, the book is only out tomorrow, but my my earliest readers, my favorite feedback, and you have, have mentioned this yourself, is like, they read the book and, and even though it's about my own family, they start to think about their own families. And I really love that. That's such a hope for me is that, and I don't want to tell anyone that that's the point of the book or anything, but I, and I don't, but I do think that it would be very exciting to me if readers, especially Western ones, read the book and they're inspired to think about, to find their own self in this story of Native American land takings. And because we all have it, really. And I have a, you know, if people are inspired to start to dig into that a little, I do have some research and resources in the back of the book and even on my website, actually, as well, that that I hope might be helpful to people to start to do their own discovery. And and it's by no means like a definitive list or something. It's just resources that were honestly helpful to me when I was beginning my research, because there is a lot out there, but it is hard to figure out. And again, no one has really been telling any of us that that's something we should do. And I, I don't want to say I'm here to say, go do that. But if you feel inspired, I think that would be great. I think that would be so exciting. The rabbi and I taught a class about a year and a half ago to, we, we wanted the rabbi, it was important to him. He'd given me all this free, free time of his to do this study. And so to give back to our larger community, we offered a free class to members of our congregation that kind of was studying the Jewish texts that we had been reading that were inspiring. And I did a lot of sharing of my research with the class. And it was so cool to see that people at the beginning of, you know, who's going to sign up for this class? People who are the ones you described, very smart and thoughtful, well-meaning people who I think a lot of them thought the history of Native Americans and in and in, in the treatment by the United States of indigenous people in this country, that's a societal thing. That doesn't really have to do with me. And I, I think that by the end of the class, people felt it was like a six-week class. People felt like they saw themselves in the story. They had found their connection here. And I... I think that would be really awesome if people could start to do that. Well, I definitely did. And I just really, I, I can't even imagine the amount of work and effort and energy and emotional 
expense of putting together a book like this, but I, I, I really, really loved it. I read a lot of books and, and I, I really loved it. And I'm really glad to be connected. And big thanks to our mutual pal, Marnie, for connecting us. You're awesome. I hope we can stay in touch and I wish you all the best with the book and with everything else you're going to be working on in the in future years. Thanks, Ed. I would love that. That would be great. Let's do it. Hey, it's Ed again. Thanks so much for listening to the podcast. I know your time is valuable, so it means the world that you spend it listening. If you want to support the podcast and help it to continue to spread and grow, there are a few ways you can help. Number one, pass it along to a friend or share it on social media. Word of mouth recommendations are the most powerful way for ideas to spread, so I'd love it if you could share the podcast with a few pals who might enjoy it. Number two, you can go to Apple Podcasts and give it a five-star review. Good reviews encourage the Apple overlords to suggest the podcast to others. So there's a link in the notes if you'd be so kind as to give it five stars. Number three, you can support the podcast financially via Patreon. And there are exclusive benefits for those who do, including a monthly behind-the-scenes newsletter, Mountain and Prairie stickers, live and recorded video chats with podcast guests, and much more. Number four, I've also got two emails that I send out. The first is my weekly email called Good News from the American West, which I send out every Wednesday. It's only positive news, something we can all use a little more of these days. And my other email is my bi-monthly book recommendations email. One email every other month with five, six, seven, or eight books that I've recently read and highly recommend. The thousands of people on both of these lists will vouch for me. No spam or other funny business. And number five, finally, check out my online store for Mountain and Prairie stickers, shirts, and coffee mugs. I've got some really cool designs from Western artists with more on the way. So head to mountainandprairie.com slash shop to check it all out. I'd love to connect with you. I'm on Instagram and LinkedIn. So look me up on either of those platforms by my name or through the links on my website. All right, that's it. Thanks so much for your support. Um,